there were about 30 participants. I think I think we're good. We'll we'll get started. So thank you all for joining us for our Roy Benke Internal Medicine Grand Rounds uh, another Thursday. Uh, really appreciate the fantastic attendance we've been having uh, this uh, so far this academic year. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Ambika uh, uh, Ambika Aranki from the Department of the uh, from the Division of Infectious Diseases and International Medicine. Uh, joining us today, uh, Dr. Aranki is an uh, assistant professor in that division. Uh, she received her Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery from Kasturba Medical College in Mangalore, India. Uh, after that, she got her master's in public health from Northern Illinois, the Northern Illinois Huskies. Victor E. Husky is the mascot of Northern Illinois. A lot of people get that confused with Southern Illinois, which are the Salukis, so very different. So after Northern Illinois, she embarked to Wayne State, uh, not too far away, uh, where she did her internal medicine and pediatrics training, followed by her, her uh, infectious disease fellowship. After a short stint uh, at SUNY Syracuse, we were blessed to have her join our staff in 2020, which was a uh, very, very good year for the Division of Infectious Diseases, Dr. Kami Kim, uh, with perfect timing, as Kami always has, recruited some outstanding ID physicians to join us, like Anthony Canella and Dr. Sherbuck, who we heard earlier in our Grand Rounds Fall Series, and Dr. Aranki. So, uh, so those physicians uh, played such a pivotal role in the Division of Infectious Diseases pandemic, COVID-19 management throughout all our facilities. And we cannot thank Dr. Kim enough for her leadership uh, during that very stressful time. Uh, so Dr. Aranki, in her short career, already has over 10 peer-reviewed publications and two book chapters, and was actually uh, named an exceptional women in medicine last year in 2022. Uh, so we are delighted to have Dr. Aranki here. She's going to give us um, a talk on tick-borne diseases, primer, not primer, like the rheumatologists like to say, tick-borne diseases, primer, and update. Thank you, Dr. Aranki, for being with us today. We look forward to your talk. Thank you, Dr. Lazama, for that kind introduction. Um, I think I will get started because I have about 93 slides to get through, but uh, here we go. I can make this work. So these are our learning objectives for today. We will review the epidemiology of tick-borne diseases, which is a huge topic, as you will shortly see. Uh, we will uh, recognize some of the important vectors of tick-borne diseases and discuss the major tick-borne disease syndromes in the US. I'm not going to be talking about global tick-borne diseases in this talk. Um, and we will summarize the diagnostics, management, and recent developments in the area of tick-borne diseases. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. So if you look at the news, uh, you will see this every single year, especially in the spring and summer months, where they talk about how much more severe this year's tick season will be compared to last year's tick season, and it just keeps getting worse every year. Um, there's a, a congressionally directed medical research program that has been assigned that has a huge amount of potential funding for any tick-borne diseases. Um, and this is as of uh, the, earlier this year in February. There's also a new uh, tick-borne diseases uh, research and education institute that has been established at Johns Hopkins in Maryland. And they have a huge social media presence trying to counteract a lot of the medical misinformation that is rampant in the area of tick-borne diseases, mainly Lyme disease. So they do this series called TikTok to use a tick pun. Um, so the incidence of tick-borne diseases is rising every year. So to use another pun, there's an uptick in tick-borne diseases every single year. Um, but overall, the US incidence of tick-borne diseases is up by more than 23% over the past 10 years or so. Uh, there are a lot of factors that go into this, but uh, some of the main ones are that there's obviously been climate change with increasing um, rates of uh, higher temperatures and humidity, as well as precipitation uh, pattern changes. There's a lot of forest fragmentation where forested or wooded areas get subdivided because of residential or commercial development. 
Uh, there's changing land use patterns because of agriculture or again, residential or industrial use. The vectors that carry these diseases are now migrating more and more north. If you look at their patterns because of uh, warmer climates up north. Uh, so there's huge range expansions of a lot of these uh, tick vectors. And there are also just growing numbers of tick populations when you look at absolute numbers uh, that are uh, you know, determined by tick surveys every year. So um, there is a huge uh, underestimation in terms of reporting of tick-borne diseases. So the, major, the main tick-borne disease that is supposed to be voluntarily reported to the CDC is uh, Lyme disease because that is the most common one. But there's about a tenfold, uh, you know, there's a tenfold change. So only about um, 30,000 cases or so get reported to the CDC as of last count. But the estimate based on lab data is that there are about 400,000 people that are affected every year with Lyme disease, just to give you an idea. Um, so these are some of the key climate, ecological, and social behavior factors that uh, affect the acquisition of tick-borne diseases. So the key climate change drivers include, like I was talking about, increasing temperatures, increasing in intensity and frequency of precipitation, and uh, changes in seasonal weather patterns. So earlier spring season, um, you know, like a hotter fall season, um, and things like that. Uh, there's also changing patterns in the ticks themselves. So the population sizes of ticks are increasing because of these climate factors, as well as the rates of infection among those ticks are increasing for the, for the actual microorganisms that cause the tick-borne disease. There's also changes in activity of the ticks themselves. So there's more, if there's more questing behavior, which we'll talk about, or if there's changing patterns in terms of what seasons they tend to bite humans or other hosts, then that can increase the risk of acquisition of tick-borne disease. Um, and then uh, we talked about habitat change. And then when you come to the, the actual human hosts, um, the main risk factors are you know, social behavioral factors. So people that engage in more outdoor activities, either because of work or recreational type activities are at higher risk, obviously, for being bitten. Um, earlier warm springs uh, uh, can, can kind of uh, you know, increase your risk. And then your your own social determinants of health. So if you take the appropriate, uh, you know, preventative measures, then you're not as much at risk of being bitten as uh, somebody who might not use any insect repellent, for example, or a tick repellent, and then goes out into the woods hunting or hiking or whatever the behavior might be. So um, <clears throat> and then uh, you know, if your uh, house uh, is in a, a wooded area. And if you're engaging in a lot of outdoor yard work, then that increases your risk of acquisition of these diseases as well. So these are some of the main factors that um, that we sort of uh, there's a lot of lot more uh, study into this every year as these patterns are changing. So <clears throat> if you look at the total number of like arthropod-borne diseases in America, the 95% of them are tick-borne. And then another interesting or important thing is that just since 2000, there have been all of these pathogens that have been discovered and described uh, just in the US. So we will actually go through pretty much all of them uh, through the course of this, this talk. But this is very concerning and these numbers are just increasing. <clears throat> So these are some of the major tick-borne disease syndromes that we see here in the US. So Lyme disease, everybody knows about that's the most common bacterial tick-borne pathogen, uh, but there are several others. And then you have your tick-borne relapsing fevers, uh, the rickettsiosis, and then um, in terms of parasitic diseases, the main parasitic disease here is Babesia. And then you have several, several viral tick-borne diseases as well. So. First, let's talk about the vectors or the ticks themselves. So this is your, uh, this guy is the main tick, uh, so the hero. So he is the uh, Lyme disease and other disease carrying tick or the black legged, or I shouldn't say he, it's a she because it's the female ticks that bite humans. So this is Ixodus scapularis. The larval stage um, is about the size of a poppy seed and the adult stage is only about the size of a sesame seed. Uh, when it's not engorged. So this is a US dime. So you can see how the sizes are compared to this little coin, uh, which is why a lot of these tick bites are missed. And uh, the other interesting thing is that um, the tick bites are also painless. So unless the tick is very aggressive, you might not actually feel the bite 
and notice the tick that's been latched onto you. Uh, the other big tick that we'll talk about is the Lone Star tick, and it's called that because of this white, distinctive white spot on the female or, or Amblyoma americanum. And then the third big tick uh, is the American dog tick or Derma centaur variabilis. This is an engorged female Ixodus scapularis tick. So you might notice the tick if it's in an area where you're doing a tick check, if it's engorged with your blood, but it might be too late by then. All right, so now we're going to talk about some of the like estimated distribution patterns in the US of these major ticks and sort of do a summary of what each tick carries, and then we'll go into detail for each one. So let's start with the black-legged tick, which is the most common one, uh, or the Ixodus scapularis tick. So I practiced for about six years in upstate New York, which is a highly endemic area for Lyme disease and for tick-borne diseases. Um, and so we saw everything in terms of um, tick-borne diseases. We saw every single manifestation of Lyme disease, so I'm very familiar with uh, and very fond of uh, this tick, not in a good way. So uh, the Ixodus scapularis tick carries several pathogens, but the main one is Lyme disease or the most common one, but it also is can be co-infected with Ehrlichiosis, so Ehrlichia anaplasma, Babesia, can also carry the Powassan uh, virus as well as uh, the pathogen that transmits uh, heart tick relapsing fevers. So this is the uh, a more detailed picture of the black-legged tick. Doesn't look like much. Doesn't have any fancy markings, uh, but these are the pathogens that it carries, and uh, it's most active in the warmer months up north. So spring, summer, and fall in the northeast, upper Midwest, and mid-Atlantic. Um, so this is this type of tick is actually called a post searching or a questing tick. So that means that um, so it cannot fly because obviously you can see it doesn't have wings. Um, but what it does is it hangs on to like the tips of the blades of grass or leaves in the vegetation in the bush or wooded area. And when somebody goes by, if they brush against that leaf or that blade of grass, it kind of just jumps onto you. So it's expending the least amount of energy while finding its hosts. And that applies to humans as well as other hosts. The other important thing about this tick is that every single stage can bite. Uh, so starting with the nymph, uh, so the really young tick is what's called the nymph stage, and that can also bite, but the adult females are the ones that tend to like biting humans. <clears throat> Next week, um, we can look at the Lone Star tick or Amblyoma americanum. You can see the range extends pretty, uh, it's, pretty it's a pretty wide range for both of these ticks. Now, this tick carries a lot of the viral pathogens, so the bourbon virus, which we'll talk about, the Heartland virus. It also carries Ehrlichia and Francisella, which causes tularemia. Um, and this tick is special because it also transmits this, this new entity that has been discovered over the past few years that's called Stari, which we'll talk about, as well as the Alpha-Gal syndrome. Um, which again, I will describe that later during the talk. So this is a very gross picture of a blood-fed, engorged female Lone Star tick, which obviously has been highly magnified. Uh, but the Lone Star, again, refers to this white spot on the female's back. Uh, it's a very aggressive tick. So Lone Star ticks are, they, they will search you out and they will hunt you down and they will bite you. So they're most active in early spring to late fall. Um, and they can cause this non-infectious entity, which we'll talk about, called the alpha-gal syndrome. Next, the American dog tick. So the American dog tick is also called Dermacentor variabilis, and it carries two very serious diseases, which are tularemia and Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Um, so again, all of these ticks are, uh, you know, very intuitively active, more active in the uh, summer months and the spring and sometimes in the fall if it's a warm year. So east of the Rockies, it's the species differs based on whether you're east or west of the Rockies. So if you're east of the Rockies, it's uh, variabilis. And if you're west of the Rockies, it's similis. All right. Next, we have the Rhyphecephalus sanguineus, which is the brown dog tick. And you can see it's found everywhere except Hawaii. Uh, and this one also carries Rocky Mountain spotted fever. It, uh, it's a very like boring looking tick. It's brown in color. Um, but it's been shown to actually transmit Rocky Mountain spotted fever, but not in the Rocky Mountains. So like Southwest U.S. and the U.S.-Mexico border and Texas. 
And uh, as the name suggests, it's actually a dog tick. So dogs are actually the primary host, but it can also bite humans. Uh, humans are always an accidental or dead end host. We don't really provide anything to these ticks except for our blood. All right, so the next we have the amblyoma maculatum or the Gulf Coast tick, which carries a specific entity. And out of all of these uh, uh, rickettsia illnesses that are transmitted by ticks, this is the one that has, in the US, this is the one that has an SCAR. So rickettsia parkeri rickettsiosis is carried by amblyoma maculatum. Um, so these ticks tend to mostly infect birds and or bite birds and small rodents, but it can also infect other wildlife or sorry, bite other wildlife such as deer and prairie dogs and things like that. And again, humans are accidental hosts. Um, almost at the end here with our tick buddies. So this one is the Rocky Mountain wood tick or another Dermacenter andersonii. It carries this uh, specific uh, entity called Colorado tick fever. So as the name suggests, very common in Colorado and also in Montana um, and parts of Washington state um, and also tularemia. So the adult ticks tend to bite large mammals and the, the littler, younger ticks tend to bite smaller mammals, which actually is a kind of a pattern for all these ticks. Then you have this other Ixodus species. So our black-legged tick lives here, but this Ixodus pacificus is the newer, newly discovered, relatively newly discovered Western black-legged tick. So it's just another species of the Ixodus genus, and it carries anaplasma, Borrelia, and um, can transmit heart tick relapsing fever. So it's very similar to our other Ixodus tick. And it looks like that, except it's found on the West Coast. So that sort of uh, completes our vector identification portion. And now we will go to the major tick-borne disease syndromes, obviously starting with Lyme. Um, so Lyme disease was first discovered. It's called Lyme disease, as everybody probably knows, because it was first described in Lyme, Connecticut. And if you notice, the pattern actually follows very neatly the pattern of the tick distribution but it has been found in other regions as well. It's basically been found in every state again, except Hawaii. All right, so I apologize for some of the busier slides. I was just trying to cram in a lot of information for everybody. So Lyme Borreliosis. So Borrelia burgdorferi, which is named after Dr. Bergdorf from like the early 19th century, sorry, uh, 20th century. So Borrelia actually has multiple species. So there are more than 20 genome species and Borrelia burgdorferi sensu lato complex is what it's actually called, the full name, which means that this is Borrelia burgdorferi in the general sense. That's what sensu lato means. And then in the US, uh, Borrelia burgdorferi is the species or the Borrelia burgdorferi sensu stricto is the full name of Borrelia burgdorferi in the US. However, there is a newly discovered species called Borrelia maonii, which also transmits, which also uh, causes Lyme disease. And these two are the only species of Borrelia that cause Lyme disease in America. However, maonii has only been described in Minnesota and Wisconsin. And this is a, a much newer species than Burgdorferi, which has been around for a long time. Now, Europe, uh, European Borrelia presents very differently compared to American Borrelia. Nobody knows why they think it's related to the genome species. So there are two main species in Europe. Uh, one is Afzelii, which causes a lot of skin manifestations, and the other one is Gerinii, which causes a lot of neurologic manifestations. However, these are not found in America. So the only two species that cause Lyme disease in America are Burgdorferi and Mayonii. So a Borrelia has a lot of heterogeneous strains which can determine the clinical presentation of Borreliosis. Um, it's obviously a zoonotic illness as we have already seen, and the cycles are very complex and can be, uh, you know, can vary by region and season. So in the Northeast US, the main um, sort of reservoir are, are white-footed mice and chipmunks. Um, deer are a hugely important host for tick propagation. However, deer do not get infected with the Borrelia. So deer are non-infectious hosts for the tick that carries Borrelia. Uh, 
So it's transmitted, as we already saw, by the Ixodus scapularis tick, which tends to have a two to three year life cycle. So the Ixodus tick has to attach for about 36 to 48 hours to a human host to actually transmit the Borrelia bacteria to the human host. So if you find your tick the same day that it has bitten you and you have taken it off, including the mouth parts of the tick, your risk of actually acquiring Borrelia from the Ixodus tick is very, very low. These are the high endemic states that we already talked about for, the, uh, for Lyme disease. So pretty much every case of Lyme disease that has been reported, and there are hundreds of thousands of them um, that are diagnosed every year, have been found in these states. So the incubation period for Borreliosis tends to be around, so it's a little bit, it's, a, it's variable. It can be as short as three days or as long as a month or longer. So we'll just very briefly, I don't want to go through life cycles of every single one, but this, I feel like this is a very, uh, it's sort of the textbook life cycle that, you know, you should really know. So the uninfected larvae, so larvae are not yet infected here. They seek a host to feed on. So usually because the larvae are small, they tend to find small animals to feed on. So usually like the white footed mice or chipmunks or little birds um, and, or sometimes raccoons and things like that. So they feed on these reservoir hosts, and that is one opportunity for the Borrelia to actually infect the larvae. Then the larvae get infected, and they kind of turn into these adolescent ticks, which are the nymphs. And the nymphs are the ones that find your secondary host. So as the tick life cycle progresses, the, the size of the mammal that it infects progresses, basically. So the secondary hosts tend to be like domestic animals, raccoons, uh, things like that, and then they uh, infect these hosts, and they can kind of get um, acquire from acquire the Borrelia during the nymphal stage as well. Um, by this time, uh, humans or uh, you know domesticated animals can become incidental or accidental dead end hosts, um, and that's when uh, humans can acquire the infection. However, the adult ticks need to mate, right? So the most efficient host for the adult ticks to mate on is deer. So even though the deer do not actually play any role in transmitting the Borrelia itself, they play a very important role in, um, in propagating the tick population, which is why when the, there's years where they have high tick burden in the Northeast, they do deer culling programs, unfortunately. Um, anyway, so once the tick uh, becomes an adult is, and mates on the deer host, it uh, then um, oviposits a huge egg mass which can contain thousands or hundreds of thousands of eggs, and then the, they, it goes through the cycle again. So this is kind of how the ticks acquire and transmit Borreliosis. Very briefly, Borrelia biology, it's actually a very fascinating pathogen. Uh, it's a gram-negative like spirochete. So you can see it's a spiral looking bacteria with, um, and it has these periplasmic flagellae, which make it highly, highly motile. And it has a specific pattern called a flat wave morphology when it is examined under the electron microscope. The flagellae are what lend the pathogen its motility and its structure. And how it differs from gram-negative bacteria is that it has no lipopolysaccharide in its outer membrane. It has a lipid bilayer and it has a peptidoglycan layer, but no LPS. So the, the Borrelia can exhibit different surface lipoproteins based on where it is living. So uh, the surface lipoproteins in the tick are different compared to the ones that it expresses in the mammalian host. And this depends on the temperature of the host, the pH, the carbon dioxide levels. And it um, has these two main surface lipoproteins called uh, OSP A and C, which it differentially expresses based on which host um, it, it's living in at that particular time. Um, and it's able to evade the immune system because of a very highly variable and persistent uh, surface protein called the vice protein. The spirochete enters the skin at the site of the tick bite, and the flagellae basically help it sort of have this propulsive motion to enter first into the skin and then into the blood and then into the remote tissues. Um, the Borrelia also has a lot of very interesting interactions with the tick sal uh, saliva proteins also, which help determine what surface lipoprotein is it's expressing and kind of help it with the transition between different hosts. The bacterium itself carries very limited genes for metabolic pathways, so it relies heavily on whichever host it's uh, living in at the time for a lot of its metabolic functions. 
So now let's talk about the clinical manifestations of Lyme disease. So <clears throat> if it goes untreated, that's when you see all these stages. So if you catch it early on and if you treat it, you're not going to see most likely the, you know, the later stages of the disease. But mainly it's divided into three uh, three stages. So the first stage is the uh, classic EM. So about three to 30 days after the bite, you have this lesion called erythema migrans, which I'll show you pictures of. And 70 to 80 percent of people will actually have this EM lesion. So it's pretty it's a pretty high number. However, the thing is that these EM lesions can be painless and non pruritic and you can miss your tick bite. So a lot of them can actually be missed if the patient is not paying attention to their own body. So during this early localized stage, it's only uh, in the skin. So it, but it can cause systemic symptoms because of an immune response. So you can have fever, malaise, chills, fatigue, headache, myalgia, arthralgia, the diffuse, like very uh, diffuse lymphadenopathy and things like that. The newer species that I was talking about, which is the Mayonii uh, borreliosis can actually cause more GI symptoms, which is not seen with the Burgdorferi species. So with Meonii, you can have nausea, vomiting, and much larger EM lesions. So the EM lesion can start off small at the site of the tick bite, but it can get larger and larger to more than five to even 15 centimeters. You can also have multiple EM lesions remote to the site of the tick bite as well. So next, if the patient does not get treated during the early localized stage, then they can go on to this disseminated early disseminated stage, which can happen in up to 60% of untreated early Lyme disease. So the, this is where you see the more scary manifestations. So we can see um, cardiac manifestations, including uh, AV nodal block or even myopericarditis. Um, some of these patients with third degree block might require temporary pacing, but never do they ever require permanent pacemakers. So a lot of times we used to get consulted on these patients to comment on whether they would need a pacemaker. But what actually uh, treats the heart block is actually treating the borreliosis with IV streptriaxone. And the heart block, you'll see it magically going from third degree to second degree to first degree, and then it resolves. So it's a very uh, cool thing to see when you're doing the right thing in terms of treating the patient. Then you can also have neurologic manifestations, which can be uh, meningitis, uh, in severe cases, meningoencephalitis. The meningitis is a lymphocytic meningitis, so you have lymphocytic pleocytosis, usually normal protein and normal glucose. Um, you can also have radiculitis, um, which can also be polyradiculitis um, or cranial neuritis. So cranial neuritis, classically, it's spatial nerve, so Bell's palsy. And um, with Lyme Bell's palsy, you can have bilateral Bell's palsy as well. So this also responds very, very well to appropriate therapy, the meningitis and the cranial uh, neuritis. In terms of dermatologic manifestations at the disseminated phase, uh, you can have multiple EM lesions. I think my record uh, of making a spot diagnosis was a guy with 15 or 20 EM lesions all over his back that had gone unnoticed by the patient and his family, uh, and he had presented with lymphocytic meningitis. So we made a really quick diagnosis, and you know, um, so I, I'll never forget that case. Um, so it's very, uh, you know, you have these very um, serious manifestations during the second or disseminated phase. Um, some of these patients, unfortunately, especially if they were treated later on in the course of the illness, can progress to a late stage uh, manifestation. And the most common one is arthritis. So usually it's a mono or oligoarticular arthritis. So the most common joint is the knee because it's a weight bearing joint. And people will present with a very inflammatory looking, inflamed looking knee with an effusion and redness and the whole thing. And you'll think it's a septic joint, but when you um, tap the knee, it ends up being Borrelia in there. So um, this can be a uh, post-antibiotic, like a, you can have either like this inflammatory arthritis or you can have a post-antibiotic inflammatory arthritis also. And this is the knee arthritis or the joint manifestation later on in the course of Borreliosis is the only situation where you need to give these patients 28 days of IV ceftriaxone. And that's the only thing that works. Otherwise, they have repeated uh, relapses of the entity. So um, late disease can also present with this pseudo stroke-like syndrome, um, late encephalopathy, you know, uh, mental fog, um, cognitive deficits, polyneuropathy, which can be both sensory and motor. And then you have this other condition called post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome, which we'll briefly talk about. This just shows a an autopsy 
of a uh, uh, patient who died from severe Lyme carditis, um, and this spirochete was demonstrated on the more thin starry stain from the cardiac muscle. So it causes direct invasion of the cardiac tissue. Okay, so this kind of is a pictorial representation of the three stages that we talked about, but I just want to point out that the presentation again is different in European Lyme versus American Lyme. So in Europe, you have this thing called borreliol lymphocytoma, which is like a lymphocytic infiltration on the earlobes most commonly, and sometimes like and it's basically like cartilaginous areas um, that's seen in stage one, and they have this other entity called acrodermatitis chronica atrophicans, which I want to show you some pictures in the next couple of slides. But we already sort of went through this, so I'm going to skip this. And so these are all the ways in which an EM lesion can present, except this one. So this last one is not, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but this last one on the right here is not an EM lesion. What this is, is a tick bite with hypersensitivity reaction. So this usually is seen uh, less than two days after the tick bite, and it's less than five centimeters because, like I said, EM is usually around five centimeters or bigger. Um, but EM has very varied presentations, and the so-called bullseye thing is a myth. So in any medicine boards or like you know steps or whatever, they'll always say patient has a bullseye rash, which basically refers to like an expansile red lesion with a central clearing, but but it's not seen that frequently. And actually the more common manifestation, and also in my experience, what you see as these plaque-like erythematous, uniform plaque-like lesions that are non-pruritic and non-tender. So the absence of a bullseye should never ever rule out EM in your head clinically when you're assessing somebody for Lyme disease. So it can also have these other sort of manifestations. Sometimes it can look more bluish. Um, sometimes it can actually have a crusted looking lesion in the center where the tick actually bit the patient. And also EM lesions are very, very hard to diagnose on people that have more melanin in the skin. So darker skinned individuals, EM looks completely different, can look very faint. Um, and you can, like I said, you can also have multiple lesions that can sometimes coalesce and just form a huge plaque. So that does not look like your bullseye rash. So there was actually a study uh, looking at uh, like you know the no, the uh, like medical practitioners and their uh, their um, ability to identify these various EM lesions and it showed very poor identification uh, abilities and in that particular study what they found was that only six percent of all the lesions that they surveyed had central clearing or like the bullseye appearance so please forget the bullseye all right. Um, why isn't this moving? Okay, so next I want to quickly talk about acrodermatitis uh, chronica atrophicans, which is only seen in Europe. This is a late, late manifestation of Lyme, and it is basically where the skin becomes highly, highly inflamed, and then it becomes atrophic. So it causes this particular thing called tissue paper atrophy. So the skin and the underlying subcutaneous tissues and the, even the vasculature can become first uh, inflamed and then uh, atrophic or even sclerotic um, and rarely can also progress to malignancy, but that's, this is not seen in the US. Oh, and just one last point about the arthritis. So the, uh, the uh, knee arthritis that's typically seen in late Lyme can present up to two to four years after the initial tick bite, especially if the patient was not treated for Lyme. But if they're in an endemic area and if they come in with this big inflamed knee, you need to have that in your in the back of your head. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the diagnostic considerations for Lyme disease. So EM rash, like I said, is a clinical diagnosis because during that early EM phase, serology really has no utility because they are not gonna be mounting the immune response yet. So the sensitivity for serology is very, very, very poor. But if you're seeing them already in the disseminated uh, stage with these end organ manifestations like carditis or neuritis or whatever it is, then serology does have some uh, have increased sensitivity. So I will go through the algorithm, but a two step serologic testing is what's recommended. But you need to use a validated uh, testing. Um, you need to use a validated test because Unfortunately, especially in highly endemic areas, and we used to see this a lot as a referral center, 
There are a lot of unvalidated multiplex panels that are now being provided to patients by providers in emergency rooms or in urgent cares that are not, uh, not validated, and they tend to have a lot of false positive results and cause a lot of confusion both for the patient and the practitioner. However, serologic testing should never ever be used to determine treatment response or to prognosticate for the patient. And patients, unfortunately, again, this is part of the misinformation that is being propagated in like the medical community as well as like social media causing a lot of amplification is that, you know, you need to do repeat testing to deter determine treatment response. That is not a thing you should never use antibodies to determine treatment response because antibodies for to Lyme can persist for months or years, um, including the IgM antibodies, not just the IgG antibodies. So if a patient comes in where you're suspecting Lyme and they've probably had a tick bite or have engaged in high tick risk, tick bite risk behaviors, but they're coming in with a more severe presentation because of the ticks, especially the Ixodus scapularis, for example, being uh, co-infected with these other pathogens, you need to consider co-infection in patients with more severe presentations. For dissemi During disseminated Lyme, you can have mild elevations in your inflammatory markers, including your sedimentation rate, erythrocyte sedimentation rate. You can have mild transaminitis, uh, mild hematuria, mild proteinuria, but all of these could also be missing. So PCR testing is now being used more, but blood PCR has no utility in diagnosing or ruling out Lyme. The only fluid, body fluid, where PCR testing is sensitive and specific is the synovial fluid. It is not, um, not sensitive or specific even in the uh, CSF. So if you have somebody where you're suspecting Lyme meningitis, you need to actually send Lyme antibodies from the CSF and from the serum to determine if this is Lyme meningitis, not PCR. A negative PCR on the CSF does not rule out Borrelia. However, a positive PCR on a synovial fluid is actually very useful to rule in Borrelia, and a negative does have, it has a pretty good uh, sensitivity and specificity for synovial fluid. So uh, molecular assays, that is PCR testing, is not routinely recommended unless you're really struggling to make a diagnosis. But like I said, the antibodies can persist for months to years, even after appropriate therapy. All right. Um, I don't want to belabor these points too much because I have a lot to go through. So I'm going to go through this one slide with the, from the CDC, which is actually really useful. So the CDC, like I said, recommends a two-step process using FDA validated or cleared testing for Lyme. Very, very important. So both the tests can actually be done on the same blood sample. And a lot of the labs will actually reflex, which our lab used to reflex in uh, uh, Syracuse. Okay. So the first test is usually, um, most commonly it's an ELISA, so an EIA or another test that your lab has. If that screen is negative, you're good, you're fine. You, you need to think of other diagnoses. Just, you know, unless, unless this is, uh, you're doing it too early during the, like during early uh, localized Lyme, then you might need to repeat the test four to six weeks later. Now, if the initial EIA comes back positive, then you need to do a second test, a second tier test, which like I said, the lab will usually reflex to it. And that most commonly what we use is a Western blot or sometimes they use other assays, but the Western blot uh, is the one that's kind of confirming and it, you might have a positive IgM you, uh, and a negative IgG if you're doing it earlier on, or you might have both an, a positive IgM and an IgG, uh, or sorry, a negative IgM and a positive IgG when you're doing it later on during the course of the illness. So, but it always has to be a two tier test and this initial screening test does not rule, uh, it does not rule in, like you're not confirming it just by the one step testing, you have to do a two step testing for Lyme. So um, the test results are obviously, as it applies to every, you know, lab test, the pre-test probability is what determines your, your testing algorithm, but I'm not gonna go through this in too much detail because I kind of already went through this. All right, so let's talk about treatment. So for EM, the recommendation, so doxy is, it, it's doxy for everything, right? So doxycycline is your drug of choice. He's your friend, it's vitamin D, just use doxycycline. So uh, it's, it's 100 milligrams twice a day and the duration for early Lyme is 10 to 14 days. If the patient is coming in with more disseminated findings, then you might need to treat longer, like some experts will treat for three weeks, some will treat for two weeks, uh, but it's doxycycline. The alternative is cefuroxime or amoxicillin. 
Um, I also want to make a brief point about doxycycline prophylaxis. So if you are in an endemic area and if you find a tick or if you see a lesion that looks like maybe it was a tick bite, um, and if you want to get prophylaxis, there is a recommendation for one dose of doxycycline. That's it, just one dose, 200 milligrams, and that's it. That's prophylaxis for the IDSA, so the Infectious Disease Society of America. However, there is another organization that is primarily driven by patient advocates called the ILADS, Lyme Disease Society, which will recommend long-term, like two weeks of prophylaxis, not treatment, which is not validated or not approved by the IDSA guidelines. Um, then when you have Lyme carditis, this is the one where you, if they have higher degree, so severe heart block, so if they're either symptomatic or if they have these criteria, then they do need IV ceftriaxone. So typically how we do it is that if they're in higher degree heart block or if they're very symptomatic or requiring a pacemaker, then you start with your IV ceftriaxone. Once that heart block starts resolving, and once it becomes milder, you can actually transition them to oral antibiotics, which is what it says over here, and which is what we do in practice. All right. So Lyme arthritis, this is the one that I was talking about, where it has been shown that doing a longer duration of therapy of four weeks um, does achieve cure rather than doing shorter days. So this is where we, we say do ceftriaxone for four weeks. But that is the longest duration of time we will recommend antibiotics for for Lyme disease if you talk to an actual infectious disease specialist. However, unfortunately, we used to see a lot of patients who had this entity called post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome, uh, where these patients are usually, there's a female, huge female preponderance, um, and patients have chronic generalized pain, myalgias, arthralgias, fatigue, sort of CFS type features, mild cognitive deficits, brain fog, you know, um, inability to work, that kind of stuff. Nobody knows what causes it, but it's thought to be more of an autoimmune response. And because females have more of that autoimmune risk, it's, you know, mostly seen in females. So there is no evidence, zero, nada, that long-term antibiotics will do anything to this. Nothing's gonna happen with long-term antibiotics. However, you will see if you go to an endemic area, which I saw a lot of this, that people will be on IV antibiotics from a non-infectious disease doctor for years and years um, and on like unvalidated therapies, which don't do anything and just bankrupt patients. So I saw a lot of this, unfortunately. Uh, but this is another entity that, uh, you know, you need to be aware of when it comes to Lyme disease. All right. So there's this new entity called STARI, which is Southern tick-associated rash illness. Nobody knows what the bug is, but we do know it's carried by this Lone Star guy, Lone Star tick. So etiologic agent is not known. The rash is similar to Lyme, but it can be larger up to 15 centimeters. And it's very similar in presentation to Lyme. It's also treated very similar to Lyme, but it's not Borrelia burgdorferi. And nobody knows what the bug is yet. And it's only been described over the past, I don't know, eight, nine years probably. Um, and it's seen more so in the South. So just another limey thing to be aware of. Okay. Um, the next thing is anaplasma. So let's talk about anaplasmosis, which is also carried by the same tick. It used to be called human granulocytic anaplasmosis. Actually, it used to be called Ehrlichia equi because it was first described in horses and Ehrlichia phagocytophilum but the name was changed. It has been nationally notifiable since 1999. It is transmitted by tick bite, obviously, but it can also, it has also been shown to rarely be transmitted through blood transfusion as well as solid organ transplantation. But there is no routine screening done for anaplasmosis. So um, the mammalian reservoir, again, is kind of similar, again, similar to like the same thing for Borrelia. But the vect it shares a vector, which is the Ixodus scapularis tick with the uh, Borrelia and Babesia and Powassan virus. Anaplasma is actually quite common in the upper Midwest and Northeast. And like I said, you can have co-infection with Borrelia. So if somebody is coming in with a very severe looking Borrelia and like presentation, you need to be thinking in your back, the back of your head about co-infections, including anaplasmosis. Uh, the incubation period is somewhat shorter, so five to 14 days, but the highest incidence in all the reported cases has been seen in uh, 
greater than uh, in people older, older than the age of 60 years old. Um, okay, so briefly about the biology. So this is an anaplasma morula in a granulocyte. It's a small obligate intracellular gram-negative pleomorphic caucus, and it prefers granulocytes or myeloid cells. Again, it has no LPS. It has a two-membrane envelope, and the outer membrane is kind of roughly looking under the EM. It has an irregular periplasmic space, and it has no capsule. It replicates in these membrane-bound vacuoles in, in the cytoplasm of the eukaryotic host. So sorry about the typo. It's not visualized in gram stain. But you have this other stain called Romanowski staining, where you can visualize the morulae, which are basically little colonies of the bacteria. So the strain, there are multiple strains, and the strains determine host infectivity. And it has these uh, major surface antigens, which are uh, the P44 and the MSP2 proteins, which are transmembrane proteins, which kind of act like porins that cause a lot of the pathogenesis and uh, host infectivity. Um, so it actually subverts the host immune response, and it's within the granulocytes. So it's a kind of a sneaky bug, and it and it can induce a very overwhelming systemic inflammatory response. So the key things with anaplasma, so these symptoms are common basically to every single tick-borne disease. So fever, headache, my malaise, myalgia, chills, anorexia. But rash is actually quite rare in anaplasmosis. And also any kind of GI, like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, that kind of stuff is usually rare. CNS involvement not really does not cause CNS involvement. Most of the time, it is a self-limiting illness, but it can be severe in older patients and in immunocompromised patients or those with chronic kidney or liver disease. Uh, asplenic people, uh, you know, like any kind of immune, uh, if people living with HIV is another big one where it can actually be quite severe. Um, so it has a predilection, like we said, for granulocytes, and you can see modulae if you're trying to make a diagnosis. Um, and the lab abnormalities, typically you can see leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, mild transaminitis, and mild anemia. However, uh, even though the overall case fatality rate is pretty low, so less than 1% for anaplasma, there have been reports of serious and fatal opportunistic viral and fungal infections not related to the tick-borne disease that have been seen in patients with severe anaplasmosis. And with severe anaplasmosis, it can actually mimic TTP or even HLH. Um, and you can also see patients with ARDS, with uh, disseminated intravascular coagulation, severe coagulopathy, severe pancreatitis, um, AKI, rhabdomyolysis. So it can be severe. Um, the diagnosis, so these are the lab abnormalities that you'll see. The blood smears are useful but not very sensitive, but you can have PCR detection, which is, has to be sent to a reference lab and it's not easily available. Um, but basically you do convalescent sera for all these diseases. So you need to see a 4-4 rise in IgG a uh, specific antibody titer by immunofluorescence assay in paired sera, not IgM, you have to see IgG, or you can do a direct immunohistochemical staining of the organism from the skin at the site of the rash, like this doesn't have a rash, but like you can do it from the skin if they have skin lesions or tissue or bone marrow. The treatment again is uh, doxy. So doxy is the treatment for, for Lyme, for anaplasma, for ehrlichia, and for basically all the spotted fever group rickettsiosis. So you will not go wrong with giving somebody doxycycline if you're suspecting a tick-borne disease, which is why you'll see ID do that all the time. All right, next, Ehrlichia. I know we're running out of time, so I'm going to kind of try to go through as many of these as I can, like in a rapid fire fashion. But Ehrlichia is another big one. And Ehrlichia actually has three species. The main one in the U.S. is Chaffinensis, or uh, it used to be called HME. and the, the the, we need to know Ehrlichia because it can actually be quite uh, severe and fatal. The case fatality rate is the highest in the extremes of age and in immunocompromised people. And the incubation period, again, tends to be similar to anaplasma, which is 5 to 14 days. It can also be transmitted via blood transfusion and solid organ transplantation. So I'm not going to go through all the agents and everything. It's all right there. But um, the biology, again, similar to anaplasma, except for the fact that this one tends to be in monocytes, right? So, again, you can see morulae, 
um, and uh, it 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 tends to uh, do a lot of things to the cytokine chemokine system with upregulating the things that help it and downregulating the things that don't. So anyway, um, moving on to the clinical manifest. So the difference between anaplasma and ehrlichia is that ehrlichia tends to be more severe. So and also about 30% of adults and 60% of kids with ehrlichia can actually have a rash. Problem is the rash is like a very nonspecific maculopapular rash. So you need to have like a cl clinical, like high index of suspicion to suspect ehrlichia. So again, same kind of, uh, you know, common manifestations like fever, headache, my malaise, myalgia, but you can also have GI manifestations which are more common in children. And like I said, it can be more severe in children less than 10 years old. So the rash can involve the palms and soles, that, so that kind of might be a clue. Ehrlichia can also cause like respiratory symptoms in more severe disease, as well as CNS involvement in up to 20% of people. When it's severe, it can cause a septic shock-like syndrome, multi-organ failure, ARDS, severe coagulopathies. And again, this tends to be more severe in people living with end-stage HIV, solid organ transplantation, and asplenics. Um, and Ehrlichia likes monocytes, just like anaplasma likes granulocytes. So that's why it was HGA and HME in the old parlance. Uh, we won't talk about Iwingi and uh, Muris. These are just other species that have been more recently discovered and are less severe than Shapinensis, which is the main player in Ehrlichiosis. The main thing with both anaplasma and Ehrlichia is that you should not be delaying therapy waiting for diagnosis because you're not going to get the diagnosis right away and the patient will die. So only about 20% of patients that are actually really, really sick, you can see morulae in them. So it's not very sensitive at all to like rely, do not hang your hat on visualizing morulae, right? But you can have, again, PCR testing sent, but the turnaround time is not going to be useful. So again, it's the same concept. You need fourfold Ryzen titers if you really want that diagnosis to write up the case or something. But you can also do direct staining. Um, and antibody tests are not useful, and IgM is definitely not recommended because it can be false positive and it can be negative in the initial stages of the illness. So again, like I said, doxycycline is the drug of choice. Usually we'll treat these patients for 10, 7 to 10 days. So briefly, tick-borne relapsing fevers. Uh, there's hard tick relapsing fevers and soft tick relapsing fevers. So there's a new species, like I said, that has been discovered that is called uh, Miyamotoi. So Borrelia, Borrelia Miyamotoi causes this entity called hard tick relapsing fever. It's transmitted by the same black-legged tick. And it's a self-resolving febrile illness that kind of relapses and remits. Very similar presentation, except that it relapses. So typically this is treated with like longer duration of doxycycline. Um, and you can send PCR, like species specific PCR testing to the CDC for this, if you want to make a diagnosis. Um, you also have these, um, these other ticks that are transmitting these relapsing fevers, and these are some of the Borrelial species that are causing, we just talked about Miyamotoi, um, but which we saw a few cases of this in New York, actually. But um, Borrelia parkeri is another one, and typically these are transmitted in the West with um, through rodents, so people will go camping or hiking or whatever and stay in these rodent infested cabins and end up with these relapsing uh, fevers. So um, it tends to present in this like uh, relapsing remitting pattern. So the incubation period is about a week to three weeks, but then they'll have these days, three days of fever and then a week of no fever and then three days of fever. And fevers can actually be pretty high, like more than 40 degrees centigrade. They have this febrile phase for like an hour or so, and then they have a kind of defervescing phase for a few hours. So it's a very uh, debilitating kind of illness. And uh, you need to be kind of aware of this entity to actually make a diagnosis. So it can be like an FUO presentation, basically, um, in the outpatient setting. All right. Um, Rocky Mountain. So Ro RMSF is a big thing, right? Like it's a very severe entity. So it's part of the spotted fever. Rickettsiosis and the main species is Rickettsia rickettsii, easy to remember, can be severe and fatal. The incidence is actually rising in older patients. So these are the, this is the 60 to 69 year olds is the age group where it's been reported. The most new cases have been reported. Most of the cases have been reported in these states. Um, these are the tick vectors. 
The case mortality rate can actually be as high as 50% if you miss the diagnosis. And these are the groups of people where the case fatality rate tends to be very high. So G6PD deficient, interestingly, using sulfur, I don't know, if they just get sulfur for no reason, they might have a higher mortality rate. No, don't know why. But delayed diagnosis of RMSF is a major cause of death. So important to know. I'm not going to go through the biology, but it has a propensity for vascular endothelium and causes damage by causing endothelial injury. Again, it's an obligate intracellular gram-negative non-motile cocobacillus. Uh, incubation period is actually quite short, so three to 12 days, but shorter in severe illness. Um, and patients can have sudden onset, high fevers, headache, chills, myalgia, you know. The rash, I want to show you some pictures. This is the early rash. So the early rash can actually be maculopapular. And you might not even have a rash in the first three days in about half of the patients. So important to do a skin exam on these patients every day to make sure you're not missing a rash. And this is one of those rashes that classically involves the palms and soles, right? Um, then you have late stage rashes, which turn purpuric from petechial, and you can actually progress to having gangrene, distal gangrene in later stages of the disease. Uh, again, diagnosis is very similar, but if they have CSF, uh, sorry, CNS manifestations, you can also get CSF analyses for these patients and send PCR from the CSF. Um, again, doxycycline is the drug of choice. Um, this just kind of summarizes all the tick-borne, rickettsial tick-borne diseases. Um, then we have rickettsia parkeri and rickettsia 364D, which are newer, at least the 364D is a newer entity. Uh, rickettsia parkeri is related to rickettsia rickettsii, but much less severe. It's transmitted by the Gulf Coast tick. This is the one I was telling you earlier has that ESCAR, which is an inoculation site, ESCAR, which precedes the fever and a vesicular or vesiculopapular rash. Sorry, I'm going so fast. I want to get through some of these. Uh, then you have Rickettsia 364D, so they don't have a species yet, but it's transmitted by this dermacenter occidentalis and causes this ESCAR. This is a kid with a Rickettsia 364D ESCAR in California. Actually, all cases of uh, 364D have been from have been reported from California only. Um, then you have tularemia, right? So this on the boards, they'll always say that you lawn mow, like you were lawn mowing and you basically aerosolized a bunny. Highly infectious bacterial pathogen, infected ticks, but deer flies can also transmit and it is a bioterror agent. Uh, incubation period is quite short. Um, so it does multiple species, but tularensis is the one that's the main one that causes disease here. But if you're suspecting tularemia and your patient will be really, really sick, you need to tell the lab because they can get infected very easily because the inoculum size is very, very low. And tularemia actually has multiple forms, uh, which again, I do not have the time to go through all of them, but um, it can present with primarily skin related manifestations or primarily lung related or GI related presentation. <laughs> the uh, diagnosis, hard to go in cultures. You can do paired sera, like I said, and um, ID consultation is recommended. But the treatment of choice, the drug of choice for severe disease is gentamicin. But doxycycline is also active for more mild to moderate disease. Then you have the one parasite, which is Babesia microti, transmitted by the same Ixodus tick. Excuse me. And it can be very severe in uh, specific populations like asplenics or people living with HIV. Um, it can also be transmitted via blood, blood transfusion, very similar to the malarial parasite. And it can actually be misidentified as the malarial parasite, except the difference. It's, so it's an intraerythrocytic protozoan, just like the malarial, so just like uh, plasmodium. However, it does not produce pigment like plasmodium does, and it can cause these things called Maltese crosses which they like asking about on the uh, internal medicine boards. Um, so it can actually be asymptomatic in about a quarter of the patients, but can cause severe and fatal disease. Um, diagnosis is PCR, but you can also identify it on peripheral smear. If you see the Maltese cross, you have your diagnosis, but can actually be pretty uh, pleomorphic and can be misidentified as plasmodium. <clears throat> 
Uh, severe disease is treated with clindamycin and uh, quinine, but the preferred regimen is azithro and atovaquone. So this is the one tick-borne thing where tick the doxy won't work. So you better watch out for Babesia because, but, but Babesia presents like malaria. So the presentation is completely different than the other tick-borne diseases. Um, I don't think I have time to really go through the viral stuff, unfortunately, but I would like to just spend one minute talking about this alpha-gal syndrome, which is a non-infectious entity transmitted by ticks. And it's a basically, I'm sure you've all seen it on the news. This is like the red meat or uh, animal product allergy to this sugar called alpha-galactose, alpha-1,3-galactose, which is found in mammals. Um, and it's thought to be associated with tick bites, but nobody knows what's causing it. They think it's an allergic reaction because of cross reactivity with the tick antigens. And it's associated with the bite of the Lone Star tick. And then this last thing is this house uh, MD. I don't know, you guys have probably seen the show, but there's this one episode in the early seasons with this girl who came in with tick borne paralysis, which is another non infectious syndrome transmitted by ticks. Um, and it's caused actually by the neurotoxin in the saliva of the ticks. Can be very rapid and progressive, and uh, can uh, the exact mechanism is not known. But the treatment is to actually remove the tick. So in, in that show, there was like a very dramatic thing where the guy kind of takes off the tick and the girl gets better. But anyway, very interesting entity. Nobody knows what causes it. Um, uh, this is just a thing about avoiding tick bites and uh, tick checks and re tick removal is a whole thing. CDC has a lot of useful information. And if you have any questions, I'm sorry I went a little bit over time because there was so much to